So I'm a first generation American, uh, born in Brooklyn, New York. My entire family is from Guyana, South America. And there was always music playing in my house. My parents loved music, classic soul, R&B era, and also music from the Caribbean. A lot of soca and calypso and reggae uh, was happening in my house. And I was 100% a product of public school music education. Decided I wanted to pay that forward and to get, uh, get a degree in music education. Went to James Madison University to do that. Uh, minored in jazz studies. Uh, got a master's degree in jazz composition and got hired to Berklee College of Music while I was finishing my master's degree. Well, I can't speak for everyone, but I don't think Black History Month is a thing, as big of a thing in black households because we live black history every day. So black history is our story all of the time. Uh, and I feel like Black History Month is maybe a time to be a little bit louder about it, but we're always celebrating and uplifting uh, um, black contributions, black art, black minds, black thoughts, and, um, and the black experience uh, as it helped shape this country. When I was in eighth grade, there were um, these CDs that used to come to my band director that would advertise uh, sheet music, marching music for the next year. And so I used to get my hands on these CDs and I would listen to them and I would try to reproduce what I was hearing on this program called Cakewalk Pro Audio. Now at the time I'd had no theory training so I didn't really understand chord structure. So I was just using my ears to kind of put down the pitches that I would hear and I would move the notes around until they felt correct. And then I would, you know, try to eventually start to create my own things and to put my sounds together. And also just in the music that I was listening to in my day to day, it was, I was able to make these connections and that kind of helped give me the tools to create my own work. When I first started writing, I was really drawn to chords, to harmony. And I think that that's why jazz and, and R&B were such strong entry points for me because they were doing things harmonically that really spoke to me. Some of my biggest composer inspirations would be the great Duke Ellington and Billy Strayhorn, um, who were always so ahead of their time and they were so prolific and had a deep love and appreciation for all art. They had really deep and unique things happening orchestrationally that were just decades ahead of their time. And, and I'm also inspired by who they were, you know, just, just um, beacons of class, and, and kind people. And, you know, Billy Strayhorn was openly gay in the 30s, um, you know, as a black man in this art form. And you look at these old pictures of the, of the Ellington Big Band and, you know, it was very much integrated and people were hugging on each other and loving on each other. And it seemed like there was just such a positive spirit about, about who they were and, um, and the situations in which they've put themselves, even though they had to deal with uh, a segregated country. And they were in situations where members of the band couldn't walk through the front door. And, you know, they had a manager who kind of uh, um, took an exorbitant cut from them because he knew that they needed him in order to be able to book these venues. And despite that, they were able to maintain their... their uh, their class and their inspiration and their talent and their effectiveness and their reach. And I find that to be incredibly inspiring. I don't think I started processing emotions and strong feelings in music until I started teaching. I wrote a piece uh, for my big band that was dedicated to a friend of mine um, and kind of her journey um, uh, going off to, to Zimbabwe to work with sick children and, um, you know, I wrote an LGBT civil rights piece around the same time because it just felt right. It felt like I had something to say on the topic. And, and so I followed it. And it was a very organic thing. It wasn't a, a hard line decision that now this is the type of music that I want to create. And this is the type of art that I want to put out into the world. I felt like I was given something to say in that moment on that matter. And so I did. Late in 2015, I got a phone call from Dr. Gary Schallert of Western Kentucky University, who had just shared with me that his group was chosen to perform at the College Collegiate Band Directors National Association Regional Conference, or CBDNA, uh, Southern, and that year was to be held in Charleston, South Carolina. 
and the shooting at Mother Emanuel Church had happened not too long before. And he said that he couldn't be in that space without honoring the lives of the people who were lost literally just across the street. And they heard my LGBT civil rights piece and knew that I had some rooting um, in work that spoke to cultural issues. And so I'm listening to Dr. Schaller um, express his wishes for the piece and, and what he was expecting. And I was kind of holding the phone away from my ear because it just, it, it seemed like such a, well, not seemed like it was such a daunting task and such a huge ask. I hadn't had a large scale wind ensemble work at that time. So I told him I would think about it and I would call him back and I hung up. And I had no intention of, of accepting it. And I called my dad and my dad said, you should probably call him back and say yes. And I did. And surprisingly, that was the hardest part of writing the piece. And it was knowing that members of church were going to be in, the, in attendance at the premiere that helped me uh, make the decisions about how the piece would sound. I knew that the most important thing to me was that they would hear themselves and their experience coming from the stage to know that they were seen and they were loved and that this piece was about them. So I decided to use the Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing, as a cornerstone melody after doing a quick search online and seeing that there were woefully few settings of, of, of um, Lift Every Voice and Sing for large symphonic ensembles. So I knew I wanted to root it in that. I knew I wanted stomping and clapping. I wanted tambourine. I wanted blues harmony. I wanted gospel harmony. And so I was really going for something a bit cinematic. And I also wanted to make sure that there was a clear journey. I had to think about what I wanted people to go through and how I wanted them to feel at the end of the piece, specifically how the piece would end. And it made the only sense to end on the entire band playing the same note, growing and growing and growing and bringing back the stomping and the clapping as kind of one voice becoming many voices and, and, and resilience and saying this will not defeat us nor will it define us. I just had to remember who this piece was about and what it was for and that it wasn't about me. And so I kind of left my strongest emotions out of the piece with the exception of maybe just a moment in the middle where I kind of let myself have my moment. But overall, I'm not in that piece because I'm not the subject of the piece. At the world premiere of, of Our New Day Begun at the Gilliard Center, I had 25 members of Mother Emanuel Church sitting right behind me. And I remember very little from that performance because I was just so overwhelmed that all I could do was kind of slouch in my chair. And I remember when the last note cut off, uh, I ran up on stage and my immediate instinct was to throw my arms out and to acknowledge those people who were sitting behind me because I wanted everybody to remember and to realize that what just happened on the stage was not about the people who were on the stage and it wasn't about me. So any applause that was being thrown our way, I tried to immediately give it back to the people who were in the hall, who had lived through that event or who had lost loved ones and, and church family in that event. That moment I remember clearly, even, if I, even though I don't remember almost anything from the performance, I remember that moment clearly um, because it made real that whole journey from the phone call to, um, to, to that last note. Right now I'm doing great work highlighting other aspects of the black experience that aren't rooted in trauma and pain and that's intentional. I've written uh, a piece that's rooted in disco and superhero themes to honor Marsha P. Johnson. I've written um, uh, celebratory black church music. I've written what I call a soundtrack to a non-existent black exploitation film. I've written a piece that's rooted in, in soca and calypso, joyful dance music from the Caribbean. Um, that, that honors my family and my heritage. So I'm making very intentional choices to highlight um, all of the different aspects and, and facets that go into the black experience. It's been not only fulfilling, but an incredibly, an incredibly rewarding uh, learning experience for everyone involved. I was commissioned to write a celebratory piece for the 75th anniversary of the Midwest Clinic. 
And I was just told that it had to be celebratory. And for years, I had been batting around the idea of exploring soca and calypso music from the Caribbean in a symphonic setting. And so this seemed like the perfect opportunity to do that. So the name of the piece, Caravana, comes from the largest uh, Caribbean festival or carnival outside of the Caribbean in the world, which takes place in Toronto. My earliest memories of carnival was uh, Eastern Parkway in Brooklyn, New York. And it's loud and it's joyful and it's colorful. And um, t I would say three of the things that I remember most clearly from all carnivals would be a flatbed 18 wheeler truck with massive rigs of speakers, blasting this music out to the point where it's literally shaking your body, overwhelming you in the best possible way and everybody having their flags of their respective Caribbean nations and kind of waving their flags all in unison to the beat. It's this beautiful collage of all these brightly colored flags. And the third part, of course, is our food. You know, the curry and the roti and the, the rum drinks and, you know, uh, um, it's just really a joyful, festive, festive atmospheres. The first part of Caravana that I wrote was the melody that comes in about three quarters of the way through. And I knew that if I could come up with that melody and if that melody worked, then I could go ahead and write the rest of the piece. The melody had to feel very conversational, as if coming from a griot. And, um, and it, and it, but it also had to feel like it, it was timeless. Um, and then the harmony underneath kind of had to have this folksy intention um, underneath it. So I came up with that first and I was satisfied with that and I orchestrated that. And I said, okay, this is working. But I knew that the most important element of, of this would be in the percussion. You know, in, in this style of music, the, the percussion is known as the engine room. And so I had to sit down and really understand these grooves and transcribe them and uh, make sure that I can conceptualize them for a concert uh, ensemble. And so I did that and then I built everything off of the groove. Everybody at a certain point in this ensemble, regardless of what you play, is a percussion instrument. And so I was also listening to uh, some of the, the great soca artists and some of the great songs for the last, I would say, five or six decades to kind of pull from different eras. And I listened for elements that were um, uh, kind of a common thread between all of the different songs. And I listened to what was different and, you know, and I just did my homework to make sure that I did this correctly. Even though this is music that I've grown up with, I was listening to it in a different way and for a different purpose than I'd ever listened to it before. So I wanted to make sure that I was honoring those elements and also bringing something new to it um, and also make sure that I was honoring myself. And in the process, I really kind of had to stretch and grow as a composer to make it work. The reason there aren't more pieces like Carabana and Wind Ensemble speaks specifically to issues of representation. There are, <laughs> there are almost no composers who are out there writing who come from the Caribbean. That's why. I am so fortunate to be in this moment where you have incredible young black composers and, and phenomenal black educators who have been in the game for decades, who are creating space for ourselves and for our stories and making pathways for young musicians who look like us. So I'm just one of a network standing on the shoulders of another network and, and creating and making sure that we're visible so that a young black musician can say, wow, this is something that I can do while wow, listening to this music. This is music that speaks directly to me and who I am. What I love about music as my uh, given art form is that I don't believe that music breaks down barriers. I believe that music phases through barriers as if the barrier is not even there. And then it just gets directly to the heart of the person and the heart of the matter. And I think that that is beautifully powerful. I love and I take very seriously having that kind of power to affect um, a change and to move hearts.